Good morning. Good to see you all. Today is the third in our uh, sermon series on shining a brighter light. We're focused on discerning, discovering the light that God has placed in your heart, in your life, and determining how best to respond to that light and shine it in this world. The last two weeks, we were looking at particular questions about discernment, related to discernment, the practice of listening for God's uh, voice in your life, to determine how that voice is calling you and how you should respond. I would encourage you to go back and and listen to those if you missed them or even if you just need to go back and touch base again before moving forward. The last two sermons were really uh, about the foundational pieces of work that we have to do before we move on to material like today. I don't mean that the sermons themselves were foundational, but they pointed to the foundational work that you kind of have to do on your own. Uh, The first was, just as a reminder, about listening for God's voice speaking from within you. To answer the question, who am I? Why do I exist? The building block of discernment is that one. It's an existential answer in church language, an ontological one. It's about your very being. Unless you are listening and hearing God's claim on your life about who you are and why you exist, it's awfully hard to move on to deeper questions about how you might respond to how God is calling you. That question, though, is the second one. How will you partner with God in the grand experiment of your life? It's a question that is answered in collaboration with God. Remember, in partnership, God can do a lot of work to call you and show you and affirm you and bring you time after time to moments of decision, but you will have to say yes and you will have to listen. You'll have to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things so that you can ultimately keep yourself aligned with God's will and say yes to the vocational question. So existential, vocational, And then we move on to a third one. The example we gave last week that might be helpful is this. Uh, Someone might be a healer in this world. Somebody who can answer the question, why? Why do I exist? Is saying, I am a healer. But then they have to choose in partnership with God whether they want to be a a paramedic or a therapist or a doctor or a nurse or one of the other thousand healing professions out there, right? That's collaborative work with God. But then even after that, we're brought to another question. What am I going to do now? If you made it through those first questions with clarity and peace, good for you. You are well along on the way. If you are still pondering why you exist and how you are to pursue God's call in your life, keep working on that. Keep working on that. That's the that's the deep stuff first, right? And answering those questions will help you move to the third. The third, though, what shall I do in small ways and in large ways is so critically important. It's what we normally think of when we say the word discernment. Most of you, in thinking about discernment, are really pondering, what am I supposed to do this weekend or with my retirement? Should I retire this year? Should I retire next year or the year after? Should I move? Should I change jobs? Should I go to this school or that school? What should I do? with my time this weekend or this year, my vacation time and PTO. Whether the question is large or small, so small sometimes that it barely even registers in our life as a decision, Christians generally are oriented in this way to draw near to God and be faithful in the choice. Our desire is to draw near, closer to God, and to be faithful, to love God. Another way of putting this is to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. It doesn't exactly help us answer the question, what, but it at least puts us in the right framework and pulls our heart in the right direction. Maybe more helpful in some ways is uh, wisdom from those who have walked this journey before us. One person I go to frequently is Elizabeth Liebert. She was a professor of spiritual life out in California and a a very faithful author about discernment uh, in the Roman Catholic tradition. She wrote a book called The Way of Discernment. 
She writes that once we have that well-framed question in front of us, what should I do about retirement? Which school should I go to? Once that's really clear, now we have access to a, a whole collection of ways of listening, approaches we can take to discern. We have a sort of apparatus that we can utilize. It includes memory and intuition, a listening to your body, your body's physical response to a thing, reason and emotion, exploring and listening to nature, and the utilization of your imagination. These are all available to all of us all the time, and how wonderful that God speaks to us in so many different ways. And in the event that that sounds like super new agey to you or something, I promise Paul writes about it in a letter to like the Romans. It doesn't matter if you didn't know the law of God, God's speaking to you through nature. That's right there at the beginning of Romans. Check it out if you need to. All right, you have access to this, but each one of us is drawn to a different way of engaging the approach. To the engineer, perhaps reason is the primary way. If I can just lay this out as an equation, I can work my way through it. I'm going to figure everything out. I can draw the diagram. It's going to work out just fine. And that's a healthy way of discerning for that one. Meanwhile, for the dancer, perhaps listening to his or her body is the approach that draws one closest to God. And all of us have access to all of it, but we also have a primary way of approaching For me, I have uh, these two different tendencies. If it's small, and it's kind of short-term, I like to use reason. The Myers-Briggs calls me a T. I'm one of those people who likes to see the logical process. I like to map it all out. And so, sure enough, if I'm wondering about what I'm going to do this weekend, at least the plan that I make is going to be one that I think of as logical. Now, what is illogical is trying to make plans when you have three kids and two dogs, but, uh, but I'm going to keep trying because it comforts my soul. If it's much farther out from that, though, or much harder, what will I do with my vocation over the next 10 years or 20 years, or how will I order my life and ministry over just the next year? There are too many variables. I can't parse it all out and begin to wonder about whether or not I should make this decision or that decision. And so I turn to a different apparatus. And I'm just sharing this because I want you to see how it works and I'm the closest example I have. For those things, I use my imagination. That's what worked better for me after trying the rest of them on. I might imagine a trusted advisor, my therapist, my spiritual director, even just my grandmother, speaking to me about the decisions that I am making. And imagine what that person might say to me to encourage me, maybe to correct me. Try to see it from that person's perspective. If that doesn't work, or even if that does, and I want to go a little farther, I will imagine my children eulogizing me. Will the decision that I'm making even register such that they will remember it one day when they are offering my eulogy. Maybe it's not that important and I shouldn't be so anxious about it after all. Or maybe it really does matter. And I want to make sure that they can say that I did my best and I was trying to be faithful. And if that doesn't work, or even if it does work, I will ponder what it would be like for Jesus to talk to me about it in paradise one day, bringing out that big old book of my life, skipping over, I hope to God, a couple of chapters there, and then pointing to 2023 and saying, all right, Remington, first of all, uh, here are the decisions that you made. And I will wonder why God didn't talk to me about any of that stuff that I was worried about with the college football season that ended here in January. I heard at 745 that the reason that Jesus doesn't talk to me about that in paradise is because Bear Bryant is in in charge of the uh, football department. Uh Uh-huh. The rude things that people will say to pastors after church on Sunday. Hmm. Praying for that one. Will Jesus look on the decision that I'm making and say, you really missed that one, Remington, or that really wasn't that important, Remington, or look at you being faithful. Look at what you did. Hopefully I can see it from that perspective. 
This year, I uh, have given some consideration to how I want to spend time apart from church ministry out in the community, volunteer service type things. And, uh, and as I give consideration to that, I, I made a change. I had been offering leadership in one nonprofit. I decided I would move that energy toward another one. Imagining a future perspective and looking back on these decisions has guided me to a new answer. But here's the thing, as I pray about that now, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. That's not just like an Anglican way of weaseling out of anything, because Anglicans sometimes do that. This is what I believe, but I could, I don't know, I could be wrong. Instead, this is a really healthy, humble way of approaching the reality of who we are as human beings. We never really know, do we? Our desire is to be faithful and draw close to God, and that's critically important, but we never really know. We could be wrong. We have to admit that our human nature is less than perfect. Our tools for listening are not well honed all the time. Our timing is less than impeccable frequently. And most of us have some kind of lingering idolatry, that voice that we have convinced ourselves is the voice of God, even though it's not. There's a lot of opportunity for error in answering the question, what shall I do? Two things, though, are important to know here. One is that God loves you in your desire to draw close to God and be faithful. God knew you were going to get things wrong sometimes. You probably knew that already. And God loves you, nonetheless, in your desire to be faithful and draw close to God. Also, as we hear from uh, 1 Corinthians today, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, God knew so much about your flaws that God plans on working with them and through them to bring about what God's doing in the universe anyway. And so your objection from time to time, well, I may not get this right because I'm flawed in this way, Paul would say, yeah, and God knew that. And God is choosing, even choosing your flaw to bring about God's plan. So hopefully that will free you up a little bit from any worry or anxiety or desire for perfection. Desire instead to draw closer to God and be faithful. And as you are freed up and your heart begins to turn back toward God, then you come back to those questions and you come up with your answer. Right or wrong, perfectly correct, maybe not, who knows? Faithful step forward. Now we do have this though as a gift. When you are coming up with your answer, what shall I do? Here is my answer. You have been given Scripture, a way of looking into whether or not this accords with God's will. We got several directions today for looking at this, the Beatitudes. Does my decision-making look anything like what Jesus said? Is the way that Jesus values the world, the way that Jesus bestows blessing? Maybe yes, maybe no. We got Micah 6, 8. What a beautiful way of talking about who we are and what we are called to be. You, you know what's good. I've told you what's good. Do justice. Love mercy or kindness. Walk humbly with your God. I've answered the question, what am I to do? And now I have to ask myself the question, am I doing justice? my loving kindness, am I walking humbly with God? If not, maybe I go back and ask myself, what should I do again? We have the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that one a long time ago. I'm going to do my best to not look down at my sheet as I try to remember all of them, love and patience and joy and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness and kindness and probably at least one or two other things. And that's why Paul says, and stuff like that really good things. They are there as gifts for you. If your answer to the question, what is bearing good fruit in this world, such that you are experiencing joy and peace and self-control and gentleness and generosity, I'm remembering some of the other ones now, if you're getting those things in your life, it's a good chance that your what is lining up with the Spirit of God working in your life. And perhaps best of all of these, or at least from my perspective, is this that Jesus taught you to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It is the first and most important commandment upon which all other things will hang. 
Love is so important that it can be the guidestone for every other decision that you will make, the covering principle, the organizing principle for all you might do. The Jesuit author Joseph Whelan, he was an advisor to, I think, an archbishop in Maryland or something like that. He writes uh, beautifully about discernment, and he will write in these little guidebooks that they'll put in discernment centers, retreat houses like the one we have down here in Sandy Springs. And he writes about love so beautifully, about the way that love can be the organizing principle, helping us to determine what we ought to do with any question that we might ask. He writes this, nothing is more practical than finding God than falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read and whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and with gratitude. Fall in love, he writes. Fall in love, stay in love, and that will decide everything. We have these guiding principles, sure, what should break our heart, the things that break Jesus' heart, and he tells us about them. What should get us out of bed in the morning? The things that are of love. What should we do with our evenings? What is loving? All of those are great questions, and they can be answered with love. Fall in love and stay in love, and that will decide everything. Perhaps you are facing a a large question of what you should do. Discern well and carefully, but more importantly, faithfully. Ever more trying to draw close to God's will, God's heart. But more importantly, fall in love. And if you're already in love, stay in love. And that will decide everything. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.